Charlie Munger would often say invert, always invert, meaning rather than trying to actually solve the problem itself, let's flip the problem. How do we solve for that and stay away from that? So for example, rather than saying, how can we actually regenerate our soil? Let's ask the question, how can we destroy it instead and then stay far away from that as possible. So this way we can stay away from these practices and by default improve our soil because we're simply not destroying them. So if I wanted to destroy my soil, these are the 10 ways that I would do it. The very first one is tillage. Tillage is so destructive to the soil structure. It inverts the soil, it completely wrecks the structure, the aggregation, everything. It exposes microbes, so we get a reduction in microbial activity and population. It destroys soil structure, which is very problematic because we need good soil structure for infiltration rates and getting water into the soil. So if we till up the soil, we destroy the structure, it becomes a very uh, loose soil bed, which then can compact on itself. And so a great way to start to destroy your soils with lots and lots of tillage, we firstly destroy the, the structure where we till, but then below that we actually also cause a compaction layer. So not only are we wrecking the topsoil, we're also compacting the subsoil. The next practice I would use if I wanted to destroy some soil is to leave it bare. So bare soil is problematic in two ways. The first one is that it exposes the soil to a lot of erosion. So if we get a big storm event, then a lot of that soil is exposed to water. And so you get uh, raindrop action, hit the soil surface, dislodge a lot of the soil particles. That can cause either surface sealing or those particles can get washed away in runoff. And so bare soil increases the amount of runoff as well as erosion, which means we're losing topsoil. So fantastic if you want to destroy soil. The other problematic uh, component is that it increases the evaporation rate. So we're going to be losing more water. Not only do we not capture water, we also lose more water um, from evaporation. The next component is that I want to remove all product from that paddock. So this is classic in uh, hay paddocks where they have a very high removal rate. Typically in these paddocks, you'll find a deficiency in potassium. More specifically, it's a deficiency in available potassium. Sometimes there's a lot in the total component, which is why it's important to get a total soil test to actually know what we're dealing with. But typically you find a lot of these paddocks are just deficient in potassium because you're, you're removing so much potassium out of the field every bale of hay. So if I wanted to destroy the soil, really what I would be wanting to do is grow as much as possible and then take it all off farm so none of that is recycling. That way we have nothing to then feed back to the soil and for our next crop. So fantastic way to destroy soil is to remove all products. So that is not only hay paddocks, but also removing all stubble. So really removing as much as possible and, and also going back to our second point, leaving it bare. So the fourth point flows on from this, and it's actually not replacing those nutrients back to the soil. So effectively, we just wanna mine the soil as much as possible. So this way we're mining the soil, we're not putting anything back, we're going to start running down on the available minerals that we have, which means we then can't properly support the final crop. So the big ones for this is calcium, potassium, uh, and phosphorus. If we can mine all those, then that's a great way to continue to destroy the soil. Next is that we don't wanna put any carbon back into the soil. So carbon is quite important for feeding microbes. It gives them the energy for activity. And it's from that activity that you get the cycle of nutrients, you get the release of minerals stuck in the parent material into the available component of the soil. Microbes also contribute a lot to plant, uh, plant health and soil structure. So if we're not supplying carbon back to the soil, then we're not stimulating our biology and we're not improving soil health. In terms of specific practices, it means we're not adding carbon-based products. It means we're not adding molasses as a soil primer. We're not adding our human coatings to our starter fertilizer. We're not using compost. We're not doing any of that. So no carbon. We're not using any green manure crops. None of that. We just want to make sure we're not adding any carbon to our soil. The next one is we want to make sure that we're applying as much nitrogen fertilizer up front as possible. So this is a great way to destroy your soil in two ways. The first one is that the soil needs to balance its carbon and nitrogen ratio. Depending on your measurements you use, it's going to be around, say, 11, 11 parts of carbon to one part nitrogen. If we apply a bunch of nitrogen, it means that a lot of that carbon is going to get burnt up um, and utilized to then maintain that balance. So if we're applying a lot of nitrogen up front, not only is it going to burn up a lot of carbon, but also it's going to exceed the capacity of our plants to actually use that nitrogen. So a great way to also make your plants sick is to just plus so much nitrogen up front that the plant simply can't handle it. So it's a fantastic way to both destroy the soil and wreck your plant health. And that's pretty much applying all your crops required nitrogen up front. Now, as a little bonus, if you want to make this even worse, you can apply more ammonium-based nitrogen products, even though that's technically better for the plant health to convert that. If we're applying a lot of it to our soil, then that's going to acidify the soil really quickly. So if we can apply a lot of nitrogen up front and also make sure it's, an, uh, it's ammonium, 
fantastic way. Next is we wanna use a lot of salt-based fertilizers or fertilizers that have a very high salt index. So this would be a great way to increase the salinity of your soil. The big problem with salinity is that it increases the osmotic pressure in your soil, which means a plant can't actually extract as much water. Even though there might be water in the soil, it's too hard for the water to extract that water. So increasing the salinity of your soil by using high salt index fertilizers. So that could be, for example, potassium chloride, great way to uh, increase the salinity of your soil. So you're adding a lot of, say, sodium or chloride, fantastic way to effectively go into drought sooner. The next component is we wanna only grow one crop. If we only grow one crop, it means that we're not having a break in disease. We're extracting the same nutrients from the same area every single year. Uh, the soil doesn't get that diversity that it needs to stimulate biology. So really, we, we only want to grow a monoculture. A monoculture every single year, the same crop, is a fantastic way to stuff up your soil. It will make sure there's lots of disease. We're extracting lots of nutrients. You're only going to be exploring that same root zone every single season. Likewise, weeds are gonna build up in that too. You're just simply not gonna get a break of any. So next on our list is applying a lot of herbicides. Herbicides are a great way to kill a lot of microbes as well as lock up key minerals like manganese. Now, ultimately, you wanna be applying as much herbicides as possible, making sure to probably using more than the required rate, just douse the thing in herbicides. And finally, we're going to remove all livestock from the system. We don't want any, any livestock. We don't want that nutrient cycling. We don't want any uh, animal impact on the land. And as a bonus one, we can also acidify the soil. Specifically, we don't want to lime. Making sure the soil is nice and acidic would be great for destroying the soil because nothing then can grow. If I was to manage a soil and my goal was to destroy it, these are the type of things I'd be doing. Now, obviously, we don't actually want to be doing that. And the whole purpose of this exercise is to discuss things that would actually destroy our soil so that we can do the inverse of this. So as we said at the start of the video, Charlie Munger would often say invert, always invert. So what are the inverse of these things? And then we can start trying to implement them. Now, obviously, some of these things we just kind of have to do. Like if you don't have a market for say livestock, I know when I went to a Nebraska, basically no one had livestock there. It's, it's just all corn and soy. And it can be problematic if you removed all your fences and there's no markets in your area for livestock. So, so we don't have to get too dogmatic about, oh, we're not doing these things, or we are doing these things. It's more so, how can we start to move away from these things so that we can improve our soil? So again, I have herbicides and tillage here. Typically, to move away from herbicides, you might wanna use tillage to control your words. Or if you wanna move away from tillage, you tend to move towards herbicides. But again, it's the direction of these things. If we can take a few things off this list, then we can start to improve our soil health faster. So the first one, tillage, obviously we wanna to go towards no-till. Bare soil, we always want to maintain ground cover. So depending on your system, if you're say a cropper, that's stubble retention, uh, which also solves our third problem, keeping as much product on the paddock as possible. Obviously we need to sell grain or we need to sell livestock or whatever, but keeping as much product on that paddock as possible. So, so again, for our broad acre guys, it's not getting rid of your stubble. For our livestock producers, it's not making hay. It's it's simply just grazing where it is so we can cycle that nutrients. But anyways, bare ground. So we wanna make sure we have fully covered ground, so ground cover. This ensures that we reduce our uh, erosion rates. So both water and wind erosion, we don't want either. Uh, we also can reduce our evaporation rate, which means there's more water for our crops. Fantastic. Removal rates. So again, we, we have to remove product so we can sell it. but there's other product that we don't have to remove and it's and simply not worth it. So that would be stubble retention. And likewise, if you're an orchard, it means potentially trying to compost uh, your trimmings, unmarketable um, fruits. Again, we don't want to make hay, we want to be able to graze everything. So keeping as much product on farm as possible, fantastic. To solve for not replacing nutrients, that's pretty obvious. We want to replace our nutrients. Now this, one, this one's an interesting one because there's some nutrients we don't, need to replace in, in such a way. So really we want everything in a balance. If there's too much phosphorus, and I've seen soils where there's you know more than a thousand parts per million of total phosphorus. So it's, it's an extreme amount of phosphorus. You don't need it all. And at that point it's causing problems. So we don't need to replace all that phosphorus. It's when your reserves are starting to run low. So we like to take a total soil test to know exactly how much of that mineral there is. And then we can determine a really good nutrition program for our clients. And so if we are removing nutrients that we know is going to lead to a proper deficiency in the totals, then it's a smart idea to uh, replace those nutrients. Next, adding carbon. So this is a great way to 
rapidly increase the microbial activity in your soil. So we can use a soil primer. Soil primers are a great way to what's called stimulate the soil priming effect. You add a little bit of labile carbon, could be molasses, could be kelp. Microbes consume that labile carbon and then ra rapidly reproduce, eat old carbon and perform a bunch of functions. So we can use a soil primer. Um, we can also use cover crops or like a green manure crop. and also add carbon components to say our starter fertilizer or our urea to increase that efficiency, but also buffer any of the nitrogen. Now, obviously we need nitrogen to grow our crops. The problem is using too much nitrogen that the plant can't actually utilize. And so ultimately we want to use just enough nitrogen to meet the crop's requirement as exactly where it is. We can also use that carbon buffering system uh, to prevent that nitrogen interacting too much with our soil carbon. So we want to use just enough N uh, with our clients. Typically what we do is we assess how much nitrogen they currently have in their soil using a Haney soil test. We consider organic nitrogen. And it's crazy to see how much actual nitrogen you already have in your soil uh, with organic nitrogen. Sometimes we're saying 50 parts per million of available nitrogen, organic nitrogen that the plant can actually use. And so that's a massive reduction in the amount of nitrogen required to supply your crop. I think that works out to be 60 or so kilos of nitrogen already in your soil that you can supply to your crop that you don't need to supply just because we've considered the right thing. But anyways, supplying just enough N means the right form, the right place at the right time. So a little bit in the starter, a little bit as I'd like, I'd rather a foliar, multiple foliar applications than a big heavy top dressing. Um, but if you can do split applications, that's better. Trying to split up your nitrogen applications as much as possible, and then also recalculating your nitrogen requirements based on how much rainfall you've had. So we, we work with our clients um, throughout the season to redetermine the nitrogen application rates throughout the season, but they also use the right products so that it's the best form. So using, again, that carbon component to it. Really, we want to make sure we're applying just enough so the plant can utilize what we've given it uh, and no more. High salt index fertilizers. What we want to do is go to low salt index fertilizers. It's going to be much better for our soil and for our plants. Salinity is such a problem, uh, especially in Australia, we, we do have a lot of salinity problems. We don't want to be adding more to our problems. We don't want to cause leaf burn if we're going to use these fertilizers as a foliar. Likewise, if we're adding all this chloride, like potassium chloride, it's not a great way to improve soil health. Alternatives to that of trying to find organic sources, it's like chicken manure. Likewise, we can buffer a lot of this with carbon, but simply just using a different source can go a long way. Monocultures, this is pretty obvious, and I mean, a lot of farmers are doing a great job already with this in terms of improving it. We're having more diverse rotations. What we could probably see in the future is more uh, polyculture crops. I think a big opportunity in the polyculture crop space is when you effectively growing a crop for it to be turned into feed and so i've talked to a few farmers where they're, they're growing a crop so wheat or peas separately but then they mix them all together to feed their animals anyways and so you might as well just put it all together and yeah there's a bit of uh, complexity with harvesting and, and getting your management right but if you can add a little bit of diversity to the system it reduces the pest and disease and as well as reduces the nutritional requirements of the overall crop. Since the crop has overall less competition, for example, with peas and wheat, the peas will have a, a more of a taproot, so it'll go down exploring deeper parts of the soil profile. Whereas the wheat, more fibrous, will stick to the top. So diversity is really the key to this. You're stimulating more soil biology. We're exploring more niches within the soil. So quite beneficial uh, to reduce our input requirements, but also improve our soil health. Now, this is a tricky one, and that's getting away from herbicides. Herbicides are so easy to use, so effective. The big one with this is reducing as much as possible. Say for example, we can use a cover crop during summer fallow. If we have enough rainfall, we can then spray that cover crop out once. So we're using one spray rather than three. That's a way of reducing our herbicide inputs. There's also opportunities to buffer the herbicide, which I've heard is pretty effective from some farmers. And the other alternative is using uh, spot spraying. So we now have uh, ground on brown technology where you can spray over your paddocks and have your spray rig has the cam uh, cameras that can spot weeds and spray them and you get a I think like a 90% reduction in your herbicide usage. Again, reducing it as much as possible. It is difficult. We do more or less need them so that we don't have as many weeds, but there's a few strategies where we can try and use less or have an integrated weed management program for that 
10, removing livestock. Obviously, we want to then integrate livestock. Integrating livestock can help with the whole system. It increases the cycling, it can reduce your weed pressure. If we say grow a fodder crop, multi-species cover crop, we're hitting you know, diversity, but also reducing our weed burden because the suppressive effect from the competition on that fodder crop, as well as the termination of the livestock, this helps break that weed cycle, also helps break disease cycles, cycle more nutrients. It's a great way to just rapidly increase your soil health. Likewise, you're also increasing the amount of products available on your farm. So we're not only just selling wheat, in canola, we're also selling livestock as well. So it adds more um, business resilience to the overall farming operation. That cycling, like the manuring of the soil, can really help increase the cycling of nutrients, but increase microbial activity. Finally, we want to really control uh, acidic soils, liming, as well as really focusing on increasing plant health using foliar applications and nutrition to then increase the amount of root extradates to feed biology. So liming and root extradates are a great way to do that. So there you go. That was a quick exercise to run through some of the things that we can start moving away from and to so that we can start improving soil health. If any of these things sound interesting to you and you'd like to implement some of these, um, sign up for a free consult, sit down with me, we'll talk about some of the ways you can start to regenerate your farm. Anyways, thanks for watching. My name's Steel. Cheers.